Welcome into a hot football show. My name is Zach Lyons, joined by Easton Freeze and producer JT of the Hot Read Podcast. Uh, Sinkers Beverages, the Kingston Group, are our sponsor. Sinkers Beverages, they drive so you can drink if you order them on Uber Eats. East Nashville, award-winning, has multiple awards, many awards. They have a cabinet for the awards, many awards. So many, many awards. awards. People so are many. saying the most awards. The most awards. People are saying the the hugest of awards uh, right. belong to Seekers Beverages, East Nashville, Tennessee. For all your liquor needs and for all your home remodeling needs is the Kingston Group, BuildKG.com. Locally owned, locally operated is one of the best. I mean, I've been inside some of their homes. We actually live broadcast from their homes. Beautiful homes and remodels and kitchens. Definitely, definitely need to go check out BuildKG.com, the Kingston Group. All right. JT, Easton, Zach, we're we're gonna kind of like be splitting a little bit of hosting duties, but for the most part, we're just going to be talking about the Tennessee Titans because that's what everybody wants to talk about on a Thursday. And unfortunately, the only people that don't want to talk about the Tennessee Titans are the four players that they signed <laughs> who gave some of the worst <laughs> press conferences I've ever seen. So Easton, uh, JT, were you at the the press conference too? I, I was not, but I share the same sentiment. And and after specifically, I thought. Uh, after Lloyd Cushenberry's um, press availability today, I texted Easton, who was there, and I said, you know, the Titans, I, I see the vision, right? I understand what they're doing, especially, especially with that left side of the line. They are trying to make the the worst media availability left side of a line I've ever seen, and that would include Lloyd Cushenberry, followed by Peter Skaronsky, followed by if they were to select Joe Alt, that completes the trifecta right there. It would be and the put most media out of business. Toast, It'd be a disaster. The most milk toast uh, left side of a line I've ever seen in my entire life. But no, yes, it, it was. Uh, you know, I didn't expect a lot, and I still was kind of let down with what happened today, <laughs> to be honest. Ethan, let me ask you, do you, you think that Ran signed all these players so his press conferences will look better next to those press conferences? Yes, it's all about it, Yes, it's all about being better in comparison. That's 100% what it is. I don't think he even watched the tape on these guys. I think it was entirely Maybe watching. Maybe Kenneth Murray. <laughs> sure, <laughs> sure. It, well, <laughs> he may really have not watched any tape. Maybe true no, for I, NWI and Jack Gibbons too. Well, we don't know. Yeah, I think that that's the number one priority for him is uh, make me look good and then play good football in that order. Well, you were there. I mean, you were there in person. I'm assuming that Rand Carthon and Brian Callahan were in the room at least. They were vibing uh, in the kinda... back on a couch. Rand was on his phone the, the whole time, scrolling on oh, something. A little, uh, a so they were couch in the uh, press conference room, huh? Well, it's not. Th so this was at the the third floor in St. Thomas Sports Park where they do yeah. like their big indoor pressers. So we're rarely up there. I don't know why they decided to do it today because I, maybe they expected a lot more people to show up, but they had all these seats out and it was like a, a setup for an introductory press conference for the head coach. And it was just kind of like the normal group. So I don't know why. Maybe they, they just left all the chairs there. I, maybe that, that would, you know, a laziness angle is a possibility there. Yeah. Ele elevator ride up. Okay. You made it Took up the stairs. No, we, no, we learned from that mistake. Took the stairs, got my steps in. Yeah, no, I, I walked in. Folks were waiting on the elevator. I said, I'm walking. I'll be up there in a minute. So let's go one at a time uh, or one player at a time. And Easton, since you were there, I'm going to let you take the bulk of this uh, this yep. conversation. But Tony Pollard, he gets up there, um, talks about how, you know, growing up in Memphis, which I relate to, uh, growing up in Memphis, he followed the Tennessee Titans, uh, Chris Johnson. I don't know if he got asked the question of what his favorite food was. Um, I know. Uh, big journal, big J journalism is dead. If you're not going to ask everybody meaningless questions, um, right. but Tony real, Pollard, did you land a plane? <laughs> there you go. That's real questions that we need to know. And of mm -hmm. course, you know, the no birds, the birds aren't real movement started in Memphis. So Tony Pollard would have, that would have been a great <laughs> okay. question for Tony Pollard. Sure. Um, but I mean, I get the sense that excitement was the buzzword throughout this thing, uh, or vibes or immaculate or whatever. But it, that seems to be the buzzword. But nobody seems excited. <laughs> yeah, it was a lot of what you expect from players signing to a team that's in a rebuilding phase where you hear the general platitudes of there's something special here, the energy in the building. And like, I do think those things are true. I don't think that they're just blowing smoke. Um, I do. This has been a theme since Ryan Carthen and Brian Callahan have been the new faces of this organization. 
the the air in the building at St. Thomas Sports Park is a little bit lighter. The the vibe is a, a different one than when Mike Vrabel was around. Not necessarily a better one, but just a different situation. And while this team had a really rough 2023, there is a sense that that was them bottoming out and it is up from here. And I think these players are excited. They just told us in the most blah way possible um which you know like who cares what what else do you want them to say exactly on a day like today i kind of think that um these introductory pressers for guys that aren't like a derrick henry caliber veteran with like a big long storied history like i think it's a it's necessary but you don't really gain a lot and today we didn't really gain a lot yeah i mean last year uh the pressers were a plus six and eleven season followed D plus being generous. D plus pressers, uh, heavy, heavy carried heavily by Cheeto's presser. Sure. Um, eleven and six on the way. That's where that's where I stand. That's how that that is the math like on the that. That's how that works. Right. Seasons are one in in the uh, presser. Uh, this is a good question. Uh, you may not even know what he looks like, but did you see Jerome Baker? Uh, I I'll be honest. I don't know what he looks like. So m maybe yeah. I did on accident, um, but I have not put a face to that name yet. Well, there you go. Um, no, no signings other than, uh, yeah, I'm going to Google Jerome Baker now and morning. see if in retrospect, I recognized him. There you go. Uh, besides Nick Westbrook, Kenny this morning, uh, nobody has been signed. Uh, you put up a poll this morning about Nick Westbrook and Kine saying that you think that the pendulum has swung the other it's way. It's a straw man. Officially, it's a straw right. man. Yes. So officially, officially, it's a straw, straw man argument man. at this now, point. Explain, explain the tweet and the poll and all that kind of stuff. So everybody knows that Titans fans for the past three-ish years, like the narrative has been everybody hates Nick Westbrook and Kine. And for folks that are like sharps on this, like ahead of the curve, it's, well, you only hate him because he was forced into wide receiver two wide receiver one at times responsibilities in these seasons where the wide receiver core was really, really hurt. And he was forced up that depth chart and you only hate him because he's playing out of his natural role where he's best fit at wide receiver four at wide receiver five. So really you hate the position he's put in. You don't hate the player. And that was the case for a while. I think a lot of fans just didn't realize that he's not bad at what he's supposed to be doing. He's not doing what he's supposed to be doing, but everyone's come around on that by now. It's a straw man argument at this point. And I, I like, I realized this this morning, I think our buddy Mike Herndon realized this this morning that it is no longer true to say most people aren't going to be happy that NWI is signed back with the Titans. Most folks want this guy to go away. He's a cockroach. You can't kill him. No folks. I think just accept him for what he is now. And so we need to adjust accordingly that NWI is a guy that folks appreciate for the role that he plays, which is a smaller one. And you I mean not 492 votes, 92.1% say no, he gets too much hate. That's strong. Um, and I I have not changed my perception for the last couple of years. I agree. He is a good wide receiver four or wide receiver five. The problem is that he sucks the life. He is the kryptonite <laughs> of other wide receivers ahead of him. He makes them weaker and he somehow always finds a way to be wide receiver two. Right. And I just don't want to take that risk. Call it bad juju. Call it paranoia. I don't care what you call it. He's but a pox on a their fact. house, in your opinion. He's just. Traylon Burks could be, would have been an all pro had it not been for Nick Whisper Kine. Change my mind. If his wow. presence was not on the team, that's if strong. his presence did not suck the talent away from <laughs> Nick Whisper Kine. <laughs> there you go. That's my take. Go. That's, that's my issue. Like, I'm not saying that he's bad. I'm not saying that people think that he's an all pro when he's not, but the problem is, is that everybody's like, we have the same conversation the last two off seasons. Mm -hmm. We, we go in the off season saying people are saying, no, it's okay. It's okay. He's just going to be your wide receiver four. he'll be your wide receiver five. And then he ends up not. So until he, he's like an unstoppable Prometheus constantly stealing fire from the football gods. <laughs> and until he has proven us that he is going to be a wide receiver, wide, re wide receiver four, wide receiver five. I, I don't want him near the team. And I, well, okay, I let me, let me ask you this. Well, I think it's a very reasonable ask. <laughs> can, I, can I ask both of you this? Is it, is it being a prisoner of the moment to say that it is shaping up for the 2024 Tennessee Titans wide receiver room? to have the best quantity and quality of guys in front of him that, that they've had in the past two or three years. Like he's got a lot of guys he's got to kill with his evil uh, on the way to that wide receiver three or, or two role. Right. 
assuming they probably I, draft I, a guy I, as well. I mean, I don't know how you guys feel about Traylon Burks. And maybe the team is is feeling that him being the Tyler Boyd of the Cincinnati Bengals trio right. is going to help Traylon Burks a lot. That seems to be the only hope that everybody can cling to right now right. is that, well, he played a lot of slot in college, so maybe this is what he's going to do then. There's the upside. And maybe that is true. But if you were asking me, based on production and historical context, what the current wide receiver depth chart looks like, DeAndre Hopkins, Calvin Ridley, NWI, Traylon Burks, Kyle Phillips. That is where you're at. And then, okay. of course, Mason Kinsey and Karis Jackson rounded out you know, at the end because they're both still on the team, uh, people got to remember. But um, that's kind of where I am at on NWI because, honestly, he has proven to be more reliable and better than Traylon Burks as a pro. And that's weird to say. And I don't like saying it. And that's scary. So you have to draft a wide receiver. <laughs> you well, have to I, I, some point. It definitely, I, I think that I've just come to the revelation that NWI is truly the perfect allegory for the five stages of grief for Titans fans, where it seems oh. like, it seems like most fans in your poll today, Easton, have co finally come to stage five acceptance. They're accepting, and, and right. that And that is, it seems like Zach is still in between kind of, you know, bargaining and depression on, on, <laughs> on NWI right now. So, like, I think we still have a ways to go, and that may include okay. drafting a wide receiver, which I think, I think you bring up a great point with signing NWI back. It's still makes it very interesting to see when the Titans will draft a wide receiver. Cause like you said, that's already five that are on the roster between Deandre Hopkins, Calvin Ridley, uh, trail on Burks, NWI and Kyle Phillips. I mean, unless you're going to bring in, unless you're going to like kind of nip this trend in the bud and do a seven wide receiver room, it, it seems like it's already getting pretty full with, with the, with the signings yeah. they do. So it'll be really interesting to see. They need to trade Malik Willis for some rate like Rondale Moore caliber wide receiver to add to the room, right? That that's yeah. The everybody, I got like five jokes about uh, they could trade him for Mason Kinsey, so they're just gonna fucking trade him to themselves. Like, are you guys? You guys are all an original, you unoriginal yeah. white people. Go back back to the back to the drawing board on that, guys. Yeah, come I mean, give me a break. All these people with the Mason Kinsey joke. Um, I mean, like someone. I will say this. Um, his name Ethan, Canadian Titans fan. Ethan. Uh, he said Terrace Marshall. Of uh, there you go from the Carolina Panthers. I don't tempt me with a good time because I'd be all in. I'm a, I'm a Terrence Marshall. Uh, just keep just uh, keep trooper. doubling, tripling, quadrupling down on that 2019 LSU team, right? Anything that pushes other wide receivers that are currently on the roster down that are not named Calvin Ridley is what mm -hmm. I am here for. I don't care if that's okay. draft, don't care if that's free agency. That's what I'm here for. And speaking of Calvin Ridley, he completely changes everything yes. for this team. Um, and you guys came up with the phrasing for that. And I really, uh, uh, applaud you guys. I really like it. So Easton, what does this give us one example of what this changes for you? Well, where my mind went immediately when they made this decision, um, is that it is a big step forward for the Titans in their free agency process in order to get to the ultimate goal of where you want to be in the draft. So let me explain, like, the way that you want to approach free agency, or at least my philosophy, and I think a lot of folks see it this way as well, is free agency is where you address your needs in order to set yourself up for reaching the draft and being able to go with the, the best player available at each position. Because when you're having to you know, pigeonhole each selection in round one, we really need to get this kind of player. We really need to get this position in round two. You're, you're having to reach more. You're having to pass up on better players in general because they don't fit the, the need that you have. Um, and so the, the discussion before Calvin Ridley joined the Titans was, man, this team is pretty locked in. You'd imagine round one, round two, it's going to be receiver and O-line in some order. That's what this team's got to do. And that was exciting because there's a lot of good receivers and a lot of good offensive linemen in this draft class. But in general, you don't really want to be in that position, right? You want to be able to go with the best players available, regardless of, of what you need, um, because that's the, the give you the best expected value plus value down the road. With this guy on the roster now, Calvin Ridley does a couple of things for them. One, it makes, and I think you were talking about this on a football show yesterday, or excuse me, uh, football and other F-words yesterday, it, it makes that 38th pick, the second round pick for the Titans, really a, a, a mystery selection at this point. Like, they could go in any direction, one would imagine. It still feels like tackle has to be addressed in round one. 
And that's the, uh, I think the reasonable thinking at this point, but that second round pick could be best player available on defense. It could be somewhere else on the offensive side of the ball. It doesn't necessarily have to be the best receiver. And it also changes if they do still draft a receiver, the way that they have to look at this group. If you were doing mock drafts before the Calvary Ridley signing and trying to find a second round receiver for this team, not only is the second round group of receivers kind of questionable, but you would get there and there'd be some of the best options, at least in my opinion, guys that weren't necessarily what the Titans needed because they were in need of a true X boundary receiver, which they now have in Calvin Ridley. And so you'd have to reach for a guy like Xavier Leggett. You'd have to reach and go after a, you know, a Malachi Corley or something that just isn't necessarily great value at 38. Well, now you're not having to pass over at 38 necessarily. If you're entranced by a Roman Wilson, if you're entranced by a, uh, a, a Xavier, a, a um, uh, Xavier worthy, like those kind of smaller guys that could instead be okay. Maybe they're the heir apparent to DeAndre Hopkins. When he moves on, you can go with the best receiver, regardless of the kind of role they're going to play on an offense, because you're no longer desperately in need for that X. Yeah. I, I will have to say it's a cha- The strategy of this whole off season has been a kind of a mystery anyway, you knew they had to reload, right? You like you knew that they have to get players and they have to sign players, but you didn't really know what kind of players, how much they were really going to spend because they're talking about slow play in it. They're going to be smart with their money. And then you hear people say they're going to be aggressive or fairly aggressive. And you just right. didn't really know what to expect. And it's been kind of a roller coaster for fans because they live and die by every signing. As soon as a new signing happens, they forget the other signing. So like, as soon as uh, I think it was Lloyd Cushenberry was the first announced signing, right. if, I, if I remember correctly, mm-hmm. and then Cheeto, and then Kenneth Murray. As soon as like Kenneth Murray was signed, they forgot about everybody else. And as soon as Sadiq Charles right. was signed, they forgot about everybody else. So yeah. like Nick Folk you know, was signed like ten seconds after they signed uh, Calvin Ridley, and right. everybody forgot. Yeah. Right. And so to me, it's just like we don't know really what to expect, but we can I tell you what, and this is something that I've been saying all, all Pollard was the first one. Oh, yeah, uh, what right. I've been saying yeah. too uh, tr- is true is that this is a totally new Titans. And this is the Titans that they want that ran Carthon. I think wanted to be last year and he mm-hmm. wasn't allowed to be. And now you're seeing what a, I guess, unchained, unhinged freedom, roaming you know wild gunslinger Rand Carthon is right now and he is like it's the wild wild west of the titans offseason you don't really know what to expect and you know he they were like ancillarily linked to um Calvin Ridley but at, as it went on they you never heard the titans were linked then all of a sudden they swoop in at the last minute and and grab Calvin Ridley and right. we, it was initially reported it was 50 million fully guaranteed but it doesn't seem like that is the the correct wording oh, from really? Spotrack. And everybody else just calls it guaranteed. They don't call it fully guaranteed. So right. we'll see what that is. But it, they were aggressive to get them, and they were quiet about it. I mean, you don't know what's going to happen coming out of that building right now without with Vrabel's mouthpiece, uh, Diana Rossini. She's kind of like grasping at straws constantly. It's like an exciting thing. And listen. I'm not going as crazy as Mike is. Mike has said that like that was a major needle mover for him. Like basically Calvin Ridley signing means they're going to the Super Bowl. But I am at least willing to give that to give the Titans credit that we don't really know if free agency what free agency is left for them. They still could sign Tyron Smith. We know Mekhi Becton has the Bengals today, but two other meetings lined up after the Bengals. Sometimes you don't get to those meetings, but I would assume the Titans are one of those meetings. Right. Jerome Baker's coming in today. Chase Young's coming in today. Or Jerome Baker, I think, is tomorrow. Chase, it's uh, Chase week, Young yeah. is today. Yeah, yeah. yeah I think okay. Jerome Baker's Friday, Chase Young today. Um, we know they've been tied to uh, Eric Armstead. We know that there has been some interest in DJ Reader, who may not leave the Lions today. But they are still at Justin Simmons, Marcus May. They are still interested in all of these big name players so that even after spending money on Calvin Ridley, that lets you know this is going to be a pretty solid free agency class already. It's going to look better and get better. But then there's the draft on top of that. Like the free agency, I have not been too terribly disappointed that they've missed out on other players, except for Patrick Queen. 
That's the only player that felt like, well, that's a really reasonable contract. I'm really surprised they didn't really overshoot it. Mm -hmm. But everybody else that left or got paid elsewhere, I'm kind of glad they didn't pay that money because you may not have gotten Calvin Ridley. You may have. Who knows what they're, what Vin Marino and Chad. Brief you didn't want to give Aziz on. that contract? Is that what you're telling no. me? Yeah, I did not. And I'm a, you know me. I was Aziz's biggest supporter out of everybody, right. but I'm not given a no. large contract like that. Mm -hmm. JT, what do you think? Well, I just think that now, like you said, the the 38th pick is just kind of up for grabs, and it's now making me realize that I'm going to have to go back now and, and look at some of that edge and D-line tape now that I once thought I didn't really have to look at. <laughs> now at, at 38, there are so many possibilities there. Like, Wait a minute, I'm, JT. Are you are you telling me Zach's going to have to tune in to the Hot Read Podcast top 10 list of each position later on in the draft? He process? might have to, I think, because his now favorite that, now <laughs> series that we do. Top 10 list. Love top 10 lists. Biggest it, hater for no know, reason on the top um, 10 lists. Now thinking about, well, could they go and, and maybe – go best player available there and take if Chop Robinson is still on the board there or Chris Braswell or fill in a, a position of need there. Heck, they could even, if some of those linebackers are there, the, the top two who are kind of far and away better than the rest of the class, it certainly right. would not be the most sexiest draft here if they took a Joe Alt and then went linebacker with a Peyton Willis or the one out of Texas A&M, I forget Edrin his name. Cooper. Uh, Edrin Cooper. Yeah, Edrin Cooper. Uh, taking him there, it, it certainly isn't very exciting or sexy, but it does fill a need there. And I think that is not something that can be taken off the table at this moment. Can I play devil's yeah, advocate on, on two things real quick and, and ask ask you guys a question? One is one is a joke, but one is not. Um, I, I do think that this raises some serious questions, fellas, about the Titans in 2022 not being willing to pay A.J. Brown a hundred million dollars on a contract. And then <laughs> yes. uh, in, in 2024, they give 92 or whatever they did to Calvin Ridley. What, what were they possibly thinking there? I mean, it, everybody knows that Rand Carthon and John Robinson have been working in unison on all contract decisions since 2016. And so he was responsible then as he is responsible now. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's crazy that, you know, I, I don't know how you can have such drastic and such quick drastic changes in philosophy from 2022 to 2024 right. i mean that it's is like they wild. fired their gm and their head coach since then or something isn't that crazy yeah. that's crazy <laughs> i'm going to put my I, fist funny. through a window <laughs> yeah what's funny to me is that like i don't understand why everybody's really hating on this contract without even knowing anything about this contract because do you guys remember when they traded and got Calvin Ridley, the Jacksonville Jaguars did. They right. were applauded as the fucking genius savants of America. Like, they should have got Huge the Nobel Milo, Peace Prize. Crazy sharp and, play. Yeah, yeah, 100%. And the problem is that everybody else hyped them up like they want to do. They, they love to hype the Jaguars. They love to hype the Colts. They love to hype other things. But they hyped it up in their head, especially fantasy football people, mm -hmm. that Calvin Ridley was going to be an unstoppable force conveniently forgetting that he hasn't played football in 1.5 years, right. which is ridiculous. And now it's like, well, the best wide receiver on the market got wide receiver market money. I don't know. We don't understand. So this is an awful trade, but I'll tell you what, if the Eagles had done it, if other teams had done it, the Chiefs they would be getting uh, flowers thrown at their feet. Oh, what a great trade. Mm -hmm. And that just goes to show why you should not care what national media thinks and you should just stick to shows like the hot read podcast football show and football and other efforts. And I've heard folks say, well, yeah, of course the chiefs and the Eagles and the bills, if they did it, they'd be applauded because they're teams that are all in now they're trying to win now. Sure. Okay. That's fine. Let's take another team. That's in a rebuilding phase like the Titans. If the commanders had gone out and made this move for Calvin Ridley, the narrative would have been, man, love it. Getting weapons for Drake may or Jaden Daniels. They're going to come in and be in the cushiest situation possible. They're going to have as much help around them. Love that preparing for your rookie quarterback as if Will Levis is not a player coming into his first full year as a starter who could benefit from the exact same thing. So it's completely and utterly ridiculous. So let me actually put the devil's advocate on one thing here. I, I'm thinking back to your show, your shows, Zach, our shows, two, three, four weeks ago, before free agency starts. 
talking about, man, the Titans have so much money to spend. Man, it historically is kind of dangerous to have so much money to spend, right? You look at the New Englands and the, the Jacksonvilles of recent years where the, you win free agency, you spend a hundred billion dollars on the sexiest names out there. And then one, two, three years later, you realize it was a disaster. You overpaid for guys. You're in cap hell because of contract, blah, blah, blah. All these things. You realize it was a, it was a, a cautionary tale. And so talking about how, you know, you don't necessarily want to win free agency. It's not a great idea. The Titans have $75 million to spend, but they shouldn't necessarily spend all of it in one free agency. Like make smart moves. And they're out here. You know, it's not like they're, they're setting the world ablaze. They've made one really, really big move for a wide receiver. They've made one large offensive line move for a center. And then they've made eight or nine other smaller moves around them. Are, are we in that territory where you're starting to wonder if, uh, like, I guess, I guess what I'm asking is, what is the difference between what they've done so far in free agency and the cautionary tale of trying to win free agency by spending all of your money on 100 players? I think to me, it's because we know that they are being realistic about their season. Right. Okay. They have told us that they think that this is a two or three year year rebuild. And sure, right. it may not look like they they feel that way. But like Logan says, 10 players for 221 million so far. That sounds like a lot, but there are teams out there that have three players for 221 million. So right. they are I mean, they, they, Carolina they Panthers are, spent a hundred million on two guards. Like right. There's different <laughs> like ways the, to go that, that to me, there you go. That is a perfect example, JT, of yeah. that is the Jacksonville Jaguar way. Is spending a bunch of money on two players while the Tennessee Titans are doing something that's smart where they're spending it on 10 players right now. And and that's just the additional, that's all the contracts, like three for 231. And of course, that is the Kirk Cousins. And listen, the Falcons were technically a quarterback away from winning their division last year. Mm -hmm. And they've gone and get D D Darnell Mooney. They traded away their other quarterback to get Rondell Moore. So they have... They have less holes to fill, but they're spending more money on those holes. The Tennessee Titans have many, many holes to fill and still a lot to go, but they were also not spending a lot of cash last year. You got to remember, they were like the bottom three or bottom four in cash spent in 2022. They'll be much higher this year. The Jaguars and the Browns are always near the top. Right. And so... Regardless of wins, regardless of past history, they've always been near the top. So I think that is the big key difference is that they are signing, let's see, three years. Let's see. I think the shortest contract of the big names has been Kenneth Murray at two. Everybody right. else has been three or four years. Mm -hmm. All the money that uh, the Texans are spending are been largely two-year contracts. And they've been big money two-year contracts. And that just shows you the different stages that you're going to be in. But these moves that they're making do allow the Tennessee Titans to be pretty competitive. I think a lot more competitive than we have initially thought heading into 2024 so far. Well, let's talk about that because well, you that mentioned your question. It does. But it, I think it's a great segue okay. to what I want to talk about, where you mentioned they are being honest with us and with themselves about what their season is going to look like. And two points that I think are important to make on that front. One going back to what was it two days, three days ago when the Texans were making a ton of moves and everybody was like, yo, the Texans have got to chill like they they are signing everybody. This it's when they when they ultimately signed Daniel Hunter and and put that defensive line together and you're realizing, holy cow, Daniel Hunter and and um, Will Anderson Jr. And these guys that they got up front now, they're going to be absolutely terrifying to face. A lot of Titans fans were in my comments and I'm sure they were in y'all's comments like. Why are the Titans not doing this? They also have a quarterback oh, yeah. going into their second year. They also have a ton of money to spend a little bit more than the Texans had. Why are they not going in on this year like the Texans are? And I think it's a fair question on the surface. There are two big differences, right? Number one is that it's pretty obvious to me, and I, I have belief in Will Levis to, to prove himself to be a franchise quarterback this season. I think that's what he's going to do. But he's not proven himself yet to be that kind of all in, push the chips to the middle of the table player like C.J. Stroud is. That's number one. Number two, the Texans are in a very different stage of their rebuilding process, their team-building cycle. They are ahead of the Titans' schedule. Not to any fault of the Titans. Well, you could argue that the Titans should have started last season before the season started, but it's the reality of the situation now. The Titans are in year one of a teardown rebuild. 
the Texans are in at least year two, arguably year three of getting draft capital, clearing the books, getting a bunch of money, setting themselves up for the future. And they now have an all in style rookie quarterback contract that they're trying to cash in on for the next two to three years. That's very different than where the Titans are. And that brings me to my second point. Where are the Titans? I think that folks, I'm seeing a lot of, and I, this is what I want to ask both of you, if, if you're seeing this as well. I think a lot of people are misunderstanding what the primary goal for Tennessee is this season in the sense that being competitive isn't actually objective number one, right? Their prime, in, at least in my opinion, maybe you can push back on this, but I think their number one goal this season with the bullet is find out if Will Levis is the guy. You have to and you will end the 2024 season with the answer, is Will Levis the future of this franchise or is he not? That's the number one goal. And so when you see folks, for example, last night, angry about giving Calvin Ridley as much money as they did because, well, they've got a million holes everywhere else on the team. What's the deal? You know, the, the defense has three or four different positions. You need starters at still. Offensively, what's the, you know, the offensive line, all of these things. Why are they addressing wide receiver and uh, presumably offensive line in the draft so heavily? And, and my point is, folks need to look at this Titan season through three lenses in this order. Lens number one, priority number one, find out if Will Levis is the guy. Priority number two, set yourselves up as a franchise for the future two to five years. Like, that's the window they're looking at right now. And then priority number three on down the list is compete in 2024. I think folks are missing the fact that if you need to spend more resources this offseason on receiver and tackle in order to set Will Levis up to, to have as fair a situation as possible to prove whether he is or is not the quarterback of the future, and that means the defense is going to let up 27, 32 points per game, and you're going to lose some games because you had deficiencies elsewhere on the roster. That's okay because that's not the primary objective, in my opinion. I I, I push back a little bit, or maybe I want to adjust your words. Okay. If we, you're you're correct, your your first two things are Will Levis setting up for sustained success. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's what you're trying to do. Uh, the, you got to remember, people got to keep in mind, the Houston Texans, Jacksonville Jaguars have spent many years in a row drafting in the top of the draft, chasing what they are trying, what they have now, maybe more for the Texans, less of the Jaguars, but a franchise built up for sustained success. And when you can do that and set yourself up like that, you are able to do stuff, but it took them four to five years to get there. Mm-hmm. The Tennessee Titans don't have to ha wait that long because of how the roster was kind of set up beforehand. You had Jeffrey Simmons. You you already have DeAndre Hopkins now. But you had a few young players to build around, including Will Levis. They just haven't hit that upper echelon yet. But I will say this. they Will Levis and building the roster through the draft, through free agency for sustained success, those things lead to being competitive. So it's like... Yes. Yes. The competitive, maybe competitive is not like on top of mind, but technically those two things, if those are successful, the result is you're a competitive football team. So yes, I, I think it's kind of both there. I call it, they're in the midst of a competitive rebuild. They're trying to rebuild to be competitive on the fly. And that happens all the time in the NFL, but they're also doing it in a way where they, they're not looking to win a Super Bowl. That's just kind of like, hey, if we make it to the Super Bowl, everything hit 100%. Kenneth Murray was an all-pro. Lloyd Cushenberry never allowed a sack. Uh, Calvin Ridley, DeAndre Hopkins stayed healthy. Uh, the rookies came in, and they were fantastic. You mm -hmm. know, all this stuff. That's all great. But what they're looking for is to take modest jumps and hope to capitalize on it in a way that shows that they're trending in the right direction because they're going to – I would say Amy Adam Strunk is okay with the direction that they're going, which is a competitive rebuild. Right. But you never know what an owner is going to change their mind on at some point through the season if results are not seen on the field. However, it's it's do or die. Like Trey, right before we went on the air, Trey put out an article on stackinginbox.com. The clock is ticking on Will Levis. The clock starts now for Will Levis. And there is no there is no excuses. They're they're doing everything right now and what we think is going to happen in the future in the draft and rest free agency. 
to not give Will Levis any excuses. And I'm right. not saying he's a guy that needs excuses, but he they're in a sense they're also trying to give that to the fans. The fans don't have any excuse to coddle and protect Will Levis, right? It's to have no doubt unless, at the unless, end of the year. Unless everybody around him gets injured. But even if <laughs> right. he gets injured, that provides doubt for his future and his viability as a Tennessee Titan franchise quarterback because he's gotten hurt almost every year dating back to his college days. Sure. So to me, the timeline is like right now, this is where you find out this year whether Will Levis is on the right trajectory or not for your franchise, and you're 100% correct. And Calvin Ridley gives you him and DeAndre Hopkins and whatever you add in the draft or the rest of free agency gives you the best way or the best uh, path to figuring out that answer. Right. Yeah, I think really it is a it's the the it's the Will Levis experiment, right? It's the quarterback experiment mm -hmm. that you you are kind of alluding to there. That it, the the clock is ticking. The experiment starts now, and the variable variable of this experiment is Will Levis or whatever quarterback you would put in there. And I think the three biggest moves, at least on offense, with Tony Pollard to kind of create that style of offense that Brian Callahan wants to wants to create with with having that kind of two headed monster tandem between him and Ty J Spears, bringing in a, a nice centerpiece in, in Lloyd Cushenberry to be that guy that um, can communicate with the offensive line that they maybe haven't had in a while. And then bringing in Calvin Ridley to not only compliment DeAndre Hopkins, but to maybe be that guy going forward for the next two years. I think with those three guys and the contracts that they're on, where it really is two years and then the third year is more of an option and uh, kind of gives them some more uh, possibilities down the road. It, it, it is the, it is the control for Will Levis so that they mm -hmm. know that this is what they want to build. The variable, let's see if this works is with Will Levis. And then if that's not, uh, if that doesn't work out, okay, the next guy, we fit him into this system that we want to do. And then we restart the experiment from there. So I think that's uh, really what those offensive pieces to me look like is that it is creating this mold. Let's fit the quarterback into it. If it works, it works. If not, we know what we need to go for from there. And I think that's what this year is. I, I think the best way to put it is that they're in a competitive rebuild, but they are building around their the the quarterback Will Levis. They're building it around around him, and if he fails, any other quarterback that they want later on should be will step into better surroundings than they would have had if they were not building around the quarterback. Okay, but Zach, this brings up this is we don't have to spend a long time on this, but this brings up a really interesting thing that I have seen from more than one person on social media in the past two days. I have been informed by a couple of people now that if Will Levis does not work out, this current regime is done. And I think that's unbelievably stupid. It's this uh, it's I centered agree. around the, the, the idea that, that I'm hearing um, and I, I try my best to to set up the argument, uh, even though I disagree with it, is that generally speaking. A GM gets one swing of the bat on drafting their quarterback. And typically that's a, you know, you say a highly drafted quarterback, usually a first round quarterback. And while Will Levis was not a first round quarterback, he was the 33rd overall pick, right? Basically a first round pick and a guy that the Titans seemingly were willing to trade back into the first round to draft in the first round. And so this idea that Rand Carthen, this is his white whale. This is his, this is, he lives and dies by the kid that he has at quarterback. I just, I don't think that there's anything to indicate that's the case because one, again, this is not drafting Anthony Richardson at four overall. This is not drafting CJ Stroud at two and then trading up and get Will, getting Will Anderson at three. You're, you're not, you're not selling the farm in that same way to get this guy. Yes. The Titans had to trade up for him again in the second round. Um, I, I don't think that Rand Carthen or Brian Callahan's jobs are inextricably tied to the success of Will Levis, I think that he could prove himself to be a big failure this year, and the entire coaching staff in front office pretty much stays the same, and they go get a different guy. Is that crazy? That that's where I'm at. If it's what they choose to do after the off season, it will, will would affect my opinion on that. Bingo. Is that if they choose to, if they see him visibly struggle in all year, and he does not make the leap that he needs to make. They because listen, they're doing everything that they want to do with Joe Burrow. They get they're getting him a center. They they got him a left guard. Uh, uh, you would assume Daniel Brunskill's back, but they are probably going to add more starting pieces on the offensive line. DeAndre Hopkins, Calvin Ridley, Chigakonko, Josh Wiley, likely another tight end in that mix. Tajay Spears, um, and 
uh, Tony Pollard in the backfield. You got a lot of outlets. They're going to give him all the responsibility. They're going to get his input, right? They're going to involve him in the game planning. They're going to involve him in some of the plays and the play calling. Not really the play calling, but the, the play designs and all this right. kind of stuff. They're, they're giving him all this responsibility. And if he sinks instead of swim and they choose to keep him after this year and he, after he sinks, they're going down with the ship. They're all three going Bingo. down together. Yep. So, but if, if he sinks and they talk to Miss Amy and Miss, and listen, obviously Amy Adams drunk, Bill Ka or Brian Callahan and Rand Carthon are going to have a lot of conversations and together during the season. If they end up all having these conversations during the season where it's like, well, listen, Will Levis is not looking good. Um, apparently it was an owner-inspired pick. Some people could have been a Vrabel pick. We don't know. We don't know who really is involved in that initial pick. Mm -hmm. But if they choose to stay with them or choose to move on, it's going to be because all three of these people had conversations that he's just not the guy and we're going to have to figure something out because we've tried everything. We gave him all this talent. I gave him all this responsibility. I don't know what to do. And I've worked with all kinds of quarterbacks in my life. You know, uh, this would be Brian Callahan, obviously. This guy just doesn't have it. But I don't think that's I don't think that's going to be the outcome. But to answer right. your question, I agree. But it depends on their decision after the offseason. Yeah, I, I would. I, yeah, I, I would agree with that. I think this, this is the year. Uh, for him, but obviously I, I would agree with you guys as well. It's not tied down to him because I, I don't think how you could have Brian Callahan be tied down to Will Levis because he wasn't in the building. Um, and yes. I think there is more uh, merit to what you're saying that it, it may have been a, a pick from either the owner or someone who wasn't here. So I don't even know how really Rand Carthen could be kind of at fault either, but I, I agree that if they choose after this year to, to tie themselves to that as well, that's where you start to question where they're going with it. Well, it's not like he was a perfect quarterback prospect either. I no. mean, if he was yeah. a perfect quarterback prospect, you would, you know, would have. And yes, they said they tried to move back up into the first round or those were the rumors or whatever, but you would have drafted them at 11th overall, technically. I mean, you had a guard, high a guard and potentially Zay Flowers, if all rumors are to believe, higher mm -hmm. than what you thought a franchise quarterback should be. So there wasn't, you knew the flaws were there, that there was a high risk, high reward chance that this was either going to work out like gangbusters or is going to work out like a bust. And I think everybody, if as long as everybody's just being realistic and honest with each other, which hopefully now that can be that can happen. <laughs> so hopefully, hopefully there is this uh, corporate culture where honesty is allowed and realistic expectations can be set. That this won't be a, a real issue because hopefully Will Lives works out. Or B, everybody understands if he doesn't work out, we tried everything. This ain't the guy. So we're going to spend the next 30 minutes on Jack Gibbons. Titans tendered uh, on restricted free agent Jack Gibbons for their middle linebacker position. Uh, no, but in, in in all seriousness, where do we want to take this conversation? Do we want to talk about what they what they do with the offensive line? Do we want to talk about the the prospect of Legarius Sneed potentially being a change uh, as a result of the Calvin Ridley signing? Where do we want to go? Let's, let's start with with uh, the offensive line because I okay. think that's that's now the focal point for everybody that's in the fan base. Every analyst is going to be, well, what are you going to do on the offensive line? They still have Andre Dillard on contract, and I know everybody's probably really upset at that, but they're going to have to figure out. Obviously, Becton Smith are still out there. Jonah Williams got overpaid by um, uh, recently, and I think it was by the Cardinals. I can't remember. Oh, uh, yes, the Cardinals. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So glad they took him off the market. Um, but <clears throat> they they have to find to me, they have to get someone on the offensive line of free agency and they have to still attack it during the draft. So they have to figure out the offensive line because that's the missing piece, right? You can right. give your quarterback all these weapons, and but he's an injury away and he's pretty easy to get injured from not being able to do anything if you don't have a good offensive line and 
I do love Bill Callahan. I am not banking on Bill Callahan being the the god of gods and being able to turn Andre Dillard and NPF and Dylan Radins into anything other than replacement level right. starters. Uh, so I I need to see what they do next, and I think offensive line is is if they don't go Joe Walt number seven, I'd be very surprised. And we'll talk about our draft strategies and everything because I know you got a, a good aggressive you have an aggressive stance to, on a certain thing, but. That is the next thing. That's the next step. You got your wide receiver. I'm not saying you're going to find your premier left tackle or your premier right tackle, but you got to find a tackle in free agency. Yeah, Bill Callahan may be a proverbial miracle worker, but he is not a literal miracle worker. And so that's <laughs> yeah. that's the question. You, you say they have to go and find somebody in free agency. You're Just to be super crystal clear on that, you mean they need to go find somebody that can start at tackle because you don't see a world in which they can roll with an MPF, a Dylan Radin's, uh, and Andre Dillard already on the roster or potentially still on the roster uh, as one of their two tackle positions next year. I am all about if you if you have the chance to upgrade, you should upgrade, and they have the chance to upgrade. Whether that's putting Becton at right tackle or maybe Tyron Smith at right tackle because they are maybe they're not really left tackle ready. I mean, Tyron Smith is has played left tackle left tackle his whole life, but he's. He's getting older, so sometimes you can mask that over on the right side or by mm -hmm. a position switch, kind of like taking a corner from safety. Maybe Becton is better suited for right tackle, but I'm sure he's going to want to be a left tackle. But you have to find someone better than the guys that are currently on the roster. And I will say this, they they tried, right? I mean, uh, Ramon Foster said they were in on Chuck's Okorafor, who right. ended up going back to the... Um, I think he ended up going to the Steelers. I'm not, man, free agency is just white. He went head. somewhere. There's a lot of players. Yeah, but but that's a guy that, like a Chris Hubbard, could start and you not have to worry about it, but he would start on the right side. That tells you what they think about these guys. I mean, they bring in Sadiq right. Charles because they're either br they're bringing in competition to either push them to be better or push them out. So that's where you're at right now is that they have to find – better offensive line players than what they have currently on the roster. Because I would be very, very shocked if they think that Dylan Radins, NPF, Jalen Duncan, Andre Dillard, or even our boy John Ajukwu, any of these guys are starters on day one. Well, as Tony says, Tyron Smith left guard, Skaronsky left tackle. You got one side solved. It's not a big deal. Well, they've already said it's Skaronsky's uh... guard, so that doesn't make any sense. <laughs> uh, okay, so let me ask you this. And, and I... I seriously doubt this is going to be the case but if it were to happen and they just double down round one joe alt round two kings lucio matea patrick paul man you got me you have I, me hooked I mean, i'm hooked are you so you're in on that i mean i i don't i'm not a are you opposed to two rookie starting didn't the the seahawks just recently do this where they had two starting rookie tackles and it actually kind of worked out for them I don't know, but I know the Kansas City Chiefs went to the Super Bowl with like two or three offensive linemen. I think they were rookies, right? I mean, the first year, right. uh, uh, whenever Trey Smith got drafted, they had like three or four new offensive linemen. I think two or three of them were rookies. Right. So I'm all, I'm all in. Like you, you, you. I, here's my dream scenario because okay. we'll talk. Let's talk the draft because let's that ties draft. into our offensive line. My dream scenario is now alt at seven. And I'm not going to turn down Roma Dunes and Malik Neighbors, but Alt at seven, Christian Jones in the fourth round, ride. Let's ride. Super Bowl bound, baby. We're going to get multiple Super Bowls out of those two guys because, <laughs> okay. like, to me, you got Christian Jones on the right. Senior year starters, baby. Can't Let's miss. do it, man. I'm in. Like, it, listen, if you want to go, if you like, you say if you want to go, Patrick Paul, Kingsley, Suamatia, or at the right side in the round two, uh, at right time, I'm, in. I'm not going to yeah. really, really care about. But my my preferred scenario is Joe Walt there, Christian Jones in the fourth, and then listen, trade that second round pick and get you go move down a few spots, pick you up a third or an extra fourth in this draft, and you're cooking. And I know you said last night, mm -hmm. Calvin Ridley has changed things for you in that you are aggressively for, you're aggressively pro trade back at number seven. I have never been more trade back in my life than I am now. And it's for this reason. And this was not something. And, and folks were saying, well, you're just, you, let's give it a couple days. You're saying that because of Calvin Ridley. No, this is, I am on the record having been pro this 
before Calvin Ridley was brought into the team. And here's the reason why I felt that with the first round pick, the Titans have at seven, if they wanted a first round receiver under no circumstances, should they trade down? They need to get one of the top three guys, but if they wanted a first round tackle. It would be doable to move back to 12, 13, 14, 15 in that 10 to 15 range, pick up a third round pick, pick up a, you know, a second and give away, you know, compensate with a, a late round pick of your own, give up a, you know, get, get a future third, something along those lines, get a little extra capital this year or next move back. Because I don't think that I said this on Twitter the other day, I don't think the drop off from Joe alt to the next four or five tackles is nearly as big as folks want to make it out to be. I think yes. Amarius Mims, JC Latham, Olaf uh, Fashionu, uh, 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 who, who, am I, who am I missing? Uh, Talise Fulaga. Fulaga. Talise Fulaga. You can put like, Troy Fontenot out there as that's, well. And that's the I fifth mean, one. I think to. that those, those – Every, Anybody but Tyler guys, Guyton. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm with you on that. I think that there's there's your tier break. I think those six guys, if you include, include Joe Alt, those are the top tackles. And I don't think, I, I do think Alt is the one, don't get me wrong. I don't think the drop-off is as dramatic as you think it is. And, and uh, you know, a lot of folks would say, well, but you need a left tackle, right? And the only, the, you know, the top two guys are the left tackles. You got to get Alt or Fashion New. First of all, can we talk a little bit about how in 2024, it's not, maybe you disagree. I don't think it's really a thing anymore that you have to prioritize left tackle when you need both tackles. I think that the value of a, a left tackle is like 10, 15% more than that of a right tackle in 2024 mm -hmm. for a couple of reasons. One, you need both tackles. Like you can't have two bad tackles. It's not that they have a need on the left side. No, my friend, they have a need on both sides. So if you're going to get a great guy somewhere, that's awesome. Would it be better a little bit on the left side? Yes, but it's not as much as it used to be because in 2024, defenses send their premier pass rushers on both sides of the ball, for, yep. or both sides of the line, pretty agnostically. It used to be the case that the left side, and here's here's where it still is a thing, right? When you get a right-handed quarterback, that still is their blind side. There still is an element of it helps to know that the guy you don't see coming all the time is blocked up pretty well. That's what gives left side the edge still. But it used to be the case the defenses would send their, you, you would send your guy. The Max Crosby on your team is coming on the left side every day, all day. That's not the case anymore, man. Nick Bosa is flipping back and forth every single game. Max Crosby is flipping back and back and forth every single game. It, 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 it's it's not the case anymore that that side is attacked at an, at an uneven rate as compared to the right side. So I don't mind the idea of getting a right tackle. I also think it is true that folks are, why do folks believe that tackles are legally bound to play in the NFL, yeah. the side that they most played in college, right? Like JC Latham would have been a left tackle in college and a very good left tackle in college. If it were not for Evan Neal, when he showed up to Alabama, right? Evan Neal was there. He shot, he slotted it on the right side because Evan Neal was on the left and he didn't move over because at that point, he, you know, he was going to go to the draft. We'll just keep him on the right side. We'll get our left tackle of the future. That was what Bama was doing. He's a big fella. He's got all the traits necessary to make that switch. Is it difficult? Yes. Switching sides is not easy. Is it impossible? No, it is not. And we've seen it happen from left to right in recent years. I find it so funny that when you have, you propose well, left tackle is moving to the right side. Everybody's like, yeah, sure. No problem. But heaven forbid you propose a right tackle move to the left side. It's impossible. It's, 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 it's pan's labyrinth. You can't do it. It's, it's a puzzle that cannot be solved. That's just not true. Fully, fully agree. I, I fully agree with everything you just said. Um, I don't know, Talisi Fuaga, JC Latham, to me, can be left tackles at the NFL. Um, you know, I I really like, I agree with you. I think Joe Alt, I think, I think there's a, here's the thing. Joe Alt is a blue chip talent. I agree. Okay. And Joe Alt with Bill Callahan would probably get you multiple, multiple all pros, pro bowls, whatever you want. Mm -hmm. But you can probably get multiple Pro Bowls with Bill Callahan, Talisi Fuaga. You can probably mm -hmm. get multiple Pro Bowls with these other guys that you're talking about the next year. May not get all pros, but then you're just talking about an award, right? Like, what's the sack difference between the guy who gets Pro Bowl and the guy who gets all pro? Two. You can only three. get one all pro left tackle in, right? I mean, there's like a you, maybe you'll just get a bunch of second team all pros. I don't know. Is that such a bad thing? <laughs> oh, no. If you're picking up extra, picking up extra draft capital, right. like that's the thing, right? You. 
left tackles. There's one left tackle pro bowler or all pro guy, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, there's not two. So only one guy. Can you, are we saying that that one guy this year is the only good left tackle in the NFL? I mean, like, we got to be realistic here. Right. So to me, I'm with you. Let, if I have been pro trade back, I, I recently it's like Roma Dunze only at number one. And I don't really think that, I don't really like coming off of that because I really like Roma Dunze and I would like destroy this entire house that I am living in. <laughs> if it was, if it was Roma Dunze, you would need to call Calvin in the Ridley, group DeAndre Hopkins. ASAP. Like if it was those three guys, yeah, I would be like, "There's no way Will Levis can fail." We are scoring forty points. We may be losing games forty-eight to fifty-two. I don't know, <laughs> but we are scoring some fucking points, and I'm sure. gonna be happy. But I think the smart thing to do, I think the smartest strategy, I think this is the best way to look at. It. You can have your preferred strategy. You can have your favorite player. You can have your favorite thing to do at number seven. But I think the smart strategy for the Tennessee Titans is to trade back a few and drop a few extra picks, pick up some extra picks, both this year draft and maybe even next year's draft. But you could probably pick up two picks in this year's draft just by trading back a few spots because people are going to want the quarterbacks and they're going to pay a premium for them. And so to me, I think that trading back is the smart, the smartest strategy out of the three. I think the, the next smart strategy is just to stick and pick and take Joe Walt if he's there. Um, even a trade back if Joe Walt's there is still the smartest strategy. And I think the third, it's not the smartest strategy at all, is to take another wide receiver. Okay. I mean, like, I mean, it's not maybe not the smartest strategy and the best use of resources, but I think it's the third best, but it's the most exciting. Let me say this. The most exciting strategy, my favorite strategy oh, of all so time, sexy. would be for them it's, to just go Roma It's, it's not safe really for work. Thing. I mean, yeah. it also, it, it builds for the future. It's not like it, DeAndre Hopkins yeah, right. most likely is not around. Like, e e even mm -hmm. though you have Calvin Ridley, at next year you have Calvin Ridley, and then who? Like, you're going to be in the same position. Neighbors. And with, with how deep NWI, this what are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it, yeah, it, it, it's the inevitability, right? It's Calvin and, and Nick Westbrook um, and then who, we don't know who else. I mean, I, it, it is. is the craziest. It's the most Mad Maxi style of, of building your team, right? Just to just to do firework shows the entire mm -hmm. time. Um, but I still... The Bengals I, did it, right? I, 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 the Bengals somewhat did it as well yes all yeah. i'm saying um, is if you do that you better plan on throwing the ball 40 times a game because you got some yeah. mouths to feed yeah. man you can't you can't be grounded right. and pounding no more um i don't, well, I don't think they are either way the, the whether one, regardless the one, of if they take that no i agree yeah, but like you need to hand the ball off like nine times every game that's what you're gonna have to do if you have all three of those receivers on the team the the one thing i will push back on in just coming back around to the the two tackles thing if you were to take a tackle in the first and then double up in the second I think, and it kind of mixes with your point. I, I think the only way you would do that is if you trade down, because then, like, the only reason I would see them go tackle, tackle is if they start to, in the next week, really bring in some more defensive pieces. Because if you don't right. bring in a couple more of these defensive pieces and you go tackle, tackle, well, I mean, you are, it, it you're you're not taking a defensive player until you, the fourth round. You better round. score forty points a game. You're going to be scored <laughs> exactly. forty points on I, I every think, game. I think it would be, and I and I, so far, I've what Rand Carthen and his team have done. I, I have really put trust in them to to know what they need, and I think they need know that they need a lot more help on defense. So, I, I think I've been slowly talked into trading back down, whether in the second or in the first, getting some picks in the third, where there is so much good defensive depth between picks 60 and pick 109 or 106 wherever the titans are there that i think one of those two rounds there whether it be the first round or the second round they really have to think about trading back in one of those rounds and picking up a pick between pick 60 and pick 106 because the defensive depth there is just so good and here's my fever dream draft draft out and go ahead zach because i'm going to transition well i was just going to say what you're talking about building up the defense the defense uh it just took a little bit of a hit. Not the Tennessee Titans, but the free agents options out there is that Kendall Fuller signed a two-year $16.5 million uh, deal with the Miami Dolphins. So a very, very reasonable deal yeah. that, again, there are ties with Kendall Fuller and someone on this uh, Tennessee Titans staff, and they weren't in on him, supposedly. Maybe they were. But again... Yep. 
doesn't seem like that expensive a deal. And that's a deal that I feel like yep. the t- Tennessee Titans should have gone on and still made because they can put him across from Cheeto and that solves a lot of your problems. So I, I would agree. He was one of my, it was, it was uh Chidobe Awuzie, Kendall Fuller were two of my top guys that I think they, they would, they would be in on specifically because like you said, the Chris Harris connection there, that's another one um, from his time in Washington. So yeah, I'm with you on that one. We've got, what is it, six weeks till the draft? Five or six weeks, something like that? I can already God, tell you. I'm just so glad it's not this week or next <laughs> uh, week. Like, they come, they got by the free agency together, just like has wiped out all my time, my free time. Yeah, we need, we need a little time to breathe before the draft, and we have that. But I can go ahead and tell you with certainty right now, my favorite genre of mock draft from now until the draft, as long as Legereus Sneed is still kind of floating out there as a possibility for somebody to go and grab is going to be the Titans trading back in the first go take the Broncos. For example, you go back to 14, I believe it is get the Broncos third round pick and a future third, for example, a couple thirds to move back a couple spots at 14. You grab a Talese Fuaga, you grab a JC Latham, you grab an Amarius Mims, you grab a Troy Fatanu. And then, and this is, this is very much like living in the simulators too much. This is like, I need a lot of things to happen for this to happen. So, don't bank on this kind of fever dream. But if they were to then flip that third and like their sixth or their fifth for Legeria Sneed, grab him, put it, put Sneed, Chidobia Wuzier, and uh, uh, McCreary. Who's the, McCreary. McCreary. Yeah, I'm like, who's still on the team? Uh, Roger McCreary as that backfield. And and, and you, you know, you, you flip your third and your sixth or a seventh for it. Now, now you're cooking with gas. You go BPA defender yeah. elsewhere at, at the second round, or you go with the, the top receiver. Like the, you don't know, talk about Mike Herndon being like a needle mover. I think this team might compete now. I'm going to have, I might start drinking the Kool-Aid at that point, if that were to be the case, because that's the biggest thing for me defensively. They've addressed it a little bit, but really shoring up the, the secondary, adding another starting cornerback, adding at least another, at least one more starting safety. And we've seen a lot of these safeties come off the market. Like are, it feels like they're kind of at a Justin Simmons or bus crossroads right now. If they were to get a top free agent, that's really going to move the needle on the back end of the defense. So um, does, does the the possibility of Legereus Sneed change for you at all with Ridley being in the building? That was another thing we had written down for this show, you know, before Ridley was on the team, it was a lot of, ah, I don't know, man, you said, are you having to send a second round pick for Legereus Sneed? And if so, how where are you going to get your best receiver? Where are you going to get your best tackle? Like you run out of options. I don't know if I love sending a top 100 pick for top 50 pick for that guy. And now I feel like people are like, I don't know, man, maybe you send the pick for the guy. Has well, it changed I think, your opinion what, in that way? I was going to say real ahead, quick. Um, I mean, if you're doing that to your point, if you're, you're competing now, if, if you do that, because not only are you trading the pick, you look at the Jalen Johnson contract, you're going to pay him $21 million on top of the guy that you just gave about $23 million a year for. So if if you trade for Legereus Sneed and then give him that contract, you better be all in because then you get into that territory where you are the winners of the off season. This is where you might be in a little too far over your head. And that's where mm-hmm. you get into cap trouble down the line. Like if you do that, you are all in on Will Levis and, and, the experiment goes from can he work to he must work, I think, in the next couple of years. So that's what my stance is still on Legereus Sneed. I think that you don't have to do that, but if they do do that, I think you, you better be all in. Mm-hmm. I, I am with you because, listen, we don't know who's going to be there in the second round, but right. we we but all three have kind of talked about it a little bit. Is like the second round is kind of a weird it's at a weird point this year where I'm just kind of like, I don't really like any of the guys I feel that the much. Same way. Now, listen, if I could trade my 38th pick, then I'm a little bit feeling pretty good, right? Like if I could trade back, trade back in the uh, second round, pick up a third, pick up a fourth as I trade back just a few spots. Okay, then I'm kind of feeling, okay, I'm feeling pretty good about the second round because I, I picked up some extra value. So like that player plus that other draft pick, makes me feel a little bit better. Like a Ricky Pearsall makes me feel a little bit better. Sure. And if I have a third round pick lying around. Mm-hmm. So I would not be totally against going against, going to get luxurious need, but I do think it sends a totally different message than what they've been talking about. And maybe 
they just want to properly set expectations for once. And and this would the action speaks louder than the words. Right. But I do like Legere Sneed better than a Kamari Lassiter or a Darius Robinson or a Kingsley Suomatia. Let, let me give the folks that, just a, a glimpse. I, he's, think, a proven, he's a proven commodity. And I'm, I'm not going to cut you off for long, but let me just give folks kind of the rundown of what we're talking about, where the Titans are at at 38. If you haven't done a lot of mock drafts, you're like, well, who are they talking about? They dislike. Here's the, the kind of guy you're thinking about. A Troy Franklin, receiver out of Oregon. TJ Tampa, quarterback Maybe. out of Iowa. Mike yeah. St. Restrill, cornerback out of Michigan. Chris Braswell, edge from Bama. Jordan Morgan, tack and tackle from Arizona. Tavian Sanders, tight end from Texas. Adisa Isaac, edge out of Penn State. Ennis Rakestraw, cornerback Missouri. Braden Fisk, D lineman of Florida State. That's the caliber of guy where you get with the Titans at 38, and you're like, that guy or a Legereus Sneed? Legereus Sneed. Big, big, big contract for Sneed, but I don't care. But you got you got the maneuverability and flexibility to take on that contract without really, really having to worry. And listen, he's a little bit on the older side, but I mean, he's playing at a high level. And that's the thing is like, if he was a guy that was kind of trending downwards, it'd be different. To me, I feel like I would go for it, and I but I would need a pick in return. Like I would okay, need like their what? third round pick because they, they pick mm. at the bottom of the third, right? So the bottom of the third is like uh, in the 90s. Something. Yeah. So, I mean, they're coming all the way up to 38 from the 90s and they're getting a contract off the books that they clearly, and they, they right now it's, he's not really on the trading block, right? Uh, from all reports, he technically has not been made officially available by the Kansas. They're not Chiefs. shopping him, right? But I will say this. I know from what I have heard, but let's say, I think, here's what I'm going to say, because there's, I think I know, I know, or I think. I think. <laughs> you nailed that, by the way. Yeah, that's exactly okay, what it is. So, I think. I think I know Brian I feel. Callahan I really, I really wants Legereus Sneed. That's how I will phrase it. Like, if I had to guess. You think it's Brian? I would say that Brian Callahan really, really wants Legereus Sneed. Now, okay. what you do with that is of your own dis decision, but he does not have final. No, the only person that has final say is Rand Carthon. But the Calvin Ridley does mm -hmm. open up a little bit more flexibility now. And that's what I heard. And that's what I have been thinking for a couple of days now about Legereus Sneed. That's what so, you've been thinking yourself. And that's Zach what Ryan I've been thinking. been thinking. That's just what right. I've been thinking. It's just so I would it, say this yeah. that <laughs> if they were to trade, for Legereus Need, I think it's in direct, it's a direct connection and reflection of the Calvin Ridley signing. I don't think it's, I think that that is, it's a cause and effect. Mm -hmm. That's how I would put it. And I, I, mean, I would be against it. The, the thinking there, back. you can see how Callahan would get there. The biggest thing that he's been in this offseason is that you learn from the mistakes and the things that have beat you in the past. Well, one thing that has really stifled him and he's had a back and forth when with the Bengals is against Legereus Sneed and that Kansas City defense. So getting a guy like that in the building to play for you, I, I make sense to why uh, a guy like Brian Callahan would probably be really, really excited about that. And I think that I think that it would say a lot about the trust that they have. Or essentially, it says a lot about the message that they're going to send. Are we? Are we? Legereus Sneed. Right, because we talked about how Rand Carthon wanted to rebuild, Mike Vrabel wanted to reload and mm. go for it. Right. What does Le Legereus needs? You're technically reloading and trying to be a little bit more competitive than what the plan was. the The Rand plan, the Chad Brinker plan was, and that's fine. I'm fine with that because you are still getting a, a premier corner to go with your secondary corner. And they're both going to be on relatively reasonable contracts. I think the Jalen Johnson was five years, 70 something million, if yeah. I'm not mistaken, which you can get out of it after three. Okay, you get out of, of Legereus Need after three years, it's pretty good. Just don't restructure. The problem with the Tennessee Titans was they restructured everybody instead of just cutting them. And, and that's what you got to do. You got to make sure you got to cut bait. That's why you have outs and contracts to try to cut bait instead of trying to reload. 
and you got to recognize when those outs are. But I I think that it's probably a little bit, I think it was dead in the water yesterday morning. I don't think that the Legarius Need trade yesterday morning was going to be a thing. Uh, it gained a lot of steam the night before free agency, but the day of free agency Wednesday, I don't think it was going to really happen. But I would say now, I think the door is probably a little bit more open and everybody inside the building is probably a little bit more open to the idea. But I, to be honest, I'm not expecting it because I don't okay. think that's the, I don't think that's the, I don't think Legere's need fits the long-term plans of this franchise, if that makes sense. Okay, so a weird it's, it's, vomit to say that. No, I, I I see what you're saying, and so that that leads me to ask the question: um, If we're assuming the Sneed trade is unlikely or is just not going to happen, which I would say is probably the case at this point, it, it may happen, but it's it's not it's not something that we are expecting to happen. I would have rather signed Kendall Fuller than trade for Legarius Sneed. Okay, fair enough. What do we think the the biggest? Obviously, tackle, tackle, tackle. That is the thing the Titans need to address in free agency, in the draft, somewhere, they need two of them. What's the biggest thing glaring for this team? Is it the cornerback position or is it safety? Because I, I, I'm i concerned about the safety position more than I, I feel like folks aren't talking about it enough because it's, you know, we, you hear the Titans are really in for a Justin Simmons and, but you look at the rest of the market. If Simmons is not the guy, look at the draft. There's not really a starting caliber guy, like a ready-made guy to slot into that. I don't know what they're going to do at safety, man. Well, I, I'm I feel better about safety because safety is such a, a a position that doesn't really matter in the big scheme of things anymore. Corners matter more than safety. Safeties are like I, the I running back of the defense. Okay, so that that's kind of where I'm at on. It I mean, Elijah Molden, and you could go you could put Elijah Molden at safety and go get Kayvon Wallace if he's still out there later on down the road and be fine at safety and not have it scares some me. big. I don't because Elijah Molden and Kayvon Wallace were good for the team last year, and they were both better than you, Kevin And you still Byron have now. Amani Hooker as well. So, I mean, yeah, you like, you have, you still have the depth there where you don't have that with, like, the cornerback position. You don't have anybody that is the caliber of Danico Autry currently. And so, to mm. me, that guy that can play multiple positions or even the guy that, if even if you turn Danico Autry and just make him a full-time, like, you got to have a nose tackle and you got to have whatever you want to call Danico Autry. To me, those are big glaring holes, but the biggest glaring hole, in my opinion, because you don't have one starter at it currently, is linebacker. <laughs> like, that is the... Yeah, okay. You yeah. have to have someone, because you, you people can white knight and hope all they want for Kenneth Murray. Now, I'm sure, you know, he's a nice guy, and maybe he will rebound. That rarely happens in the NFL that a guy for four years who was below average starter for four years suddenly turns into something that he wasn't. Hey, and to his credit, he essentially said it today. He gave a pretty honest yeah. assessment of his career so far. He said, like, listen, right. it's not been the storybook start for me that I wanted, but you know, I feel like I'm on the player on the rise and at least it still has that confidence, but yeah. Yeah. And you at least want a guy that has some confidence. I agree with that. <laughs> if he walked up there and like, don't have lie, anybody. I, would, I was surprised like, I got this contract too. I kind of blow. Yeah. I don't know what the deal is. That would have been a yeah. problem. Yeah, Aziz, the hole left by Aziz that he filled with for two linebackers, right? He filled the role for David Long and um, I guess it was Dylan Cole the previous Dylan Cole, year, but yeah, for Zach Cunningham if you want. But he filled mm -hmm. the role the role of linebacker for two spots. And now, right now, your whoever you get is probably still likely going to have to fill the role for two spots. He's going to have to be a guy that can play three downs constantly a thousand snap guys what you're looking for good luck right. at linebacker for finding that and listen jerome baker is great i'd be all for jerome baker but that guy he's coming off an injury don't know what, the, what we're gonna see out of jerome baker next year in 2024 but you that is the biggest hole then i would go from there other corner then i would go to defensive line Danico Autry role Mm -hmm. Than safety, like safety is okay. so far is the last. My I think you've changed my mind. Uh, I think concern. you've changed my mind. So hang on, explain explain to folks that that may not be aware. Like it's it's not that he has no good tape out there. He's played some games. Where you're like, okay, I, I see the vision. Um, but explain to folks why even if you're getting the best version of him, you still desperately need another linebacker to do other things he can't. 
Well, here, here's why. you He's not this a green Kenneth dot Murray, linebacker. By the way. I didn't even mention his name. Right? Kenneth Murray. Yeah. Yeah. So Kenneth Murray is not your green dot linebacker. Right. And why? Typically, teams have a green dot linebacker that rarely, rarely comes off the field. Your Roquan Smith, your Fred Warner, those guys that come off the field. Tennessee Titans last year was Aziz Al Shayir, mm -hmm. played over a thousand snaps. Uh, but typically, they have guys that can play upwards of a thousand snaps, two guys, two guys that can play all three phases. The problem is, is that to get the best out of Kenneth Murray, you're going to have to take advantage of what he th thinks his skill set is like he's very instinctual but he's very strong and fast which yes. means that if you put him as a quarterback spy or running back spy he's going to be able to handle that if you are asking him to diagnose zone whatever's happening in a um in zone coverage and trying to diagnose that and trying to figure out do i take that route or this wide receiver which one do i do like that's where you're getting into an issue. And that's typically what your green dot linebacker, your green dot linebacker gets every. So basically what to get the best out of Kenneth Murray, you have to have a calming force that can handle the load of all the mental aspects of the game, getting people in the right position, calling the plays, diagnosing the offense and making sure everyone's doing their adjustments properly on the field. Kenneth Murray needs to be a mercenary. Here's yes. my one job on this one play. I'm going to do it. And I think if you do that, you can get average to maybe slightly above average play. But that's going to have to be how you do it. You have to take as much responsibility away <laughs> from Kenneth Murray, and you have to have a linebacker that can take all that responsibility and be able to be that guy a thousand snaps every, every this season. Yeah. Okay. I, I think a, a great explanation. I agree a hundred percent. I have one more question and then we can, whatever we also want to talk about and then we can get out of here. Um, of the remaining free agents out there, like I'm just looking at the remaining list of unsigned guys on PFF right now. Is there a guy? And if so, who are you like, I'd kill for this guy to be on the team and why? Ooh, of any I'll, position, I'll let you think about it. I, I, mean, I have my I think, answer. I think, I think my guy would be, DJ Reader, mine is I, 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 that. I was gonna say the same one. Good content, guys. Is that Good everybody's content. guy? It is. Yeah, yeah. I'd kill for DJ Reader on this team. Yeah, I, I think that. I, I mean, here's. We'll give you a couple of guys. Okay. If you wanted to go get Marcus Peters, I'd be fine with Marcus Peters. I'm not killing anybody for Marcus Peters, or I have to have Marcus Peters. But that's a guy. I hope you're not killing anybody for anybody. Just to be yeah. super clear, Stephon yeah. Gilmore, Stephen Nelson are some cornerbacks. Listen. I'd take a flyer on Tredavious White. I know everybody's down on Tredavious White right now, uh, but that's going to be a guy that's going to be super motivated. I'd be, I'd be okay with either of those guys uh, for a defensive back across from Chidobe, Chidobe, or Chidobe. Chidobe. Um, I think I think Jerome Baker is going to be one of the guys that I'm really pushing hard for. Uh, Tyrell Dotson, I would go ahead and sign both of them if you could. Tyrell Dotson was also a linebacker from Buffalo. He's really young. He's he could be your Jerome Baker insurance if he weren't to if he were to get injured or something. Um, but I mean, I think DJ Reader is the guy that I'm like most coveting right now out on this free agency. Yeah, I would agree that it's 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 Reader. If I could go out and if I could go to Rand Carthon when I was there today and say, ran, uh, sorry, you have to make the signing right now. Thanks. I'm going to know it's done. It would be DJ reader just because it would fill that pretty significant gap. That they have up front on defense right now, in terms of giving me peace of mind for the next five, six weeks before the draft. Um, I would probably go Makai Becton just because I would, I would feel at ease that if they were to come out with one, Oh, just, just one tackle in their draft class. I'm not, terrified like that that would be the case you know what i mean because if they go into this draft without addressing the need in free agency like you talked about earlier zach i'm scared man if like i'm i'm gonna be silently rooting tackle tackle go tackle tackle please just go tackle tackle make me happy um and they probably won't and so getting makai becton who is again not a certainty but the way that he played as a rookie on that jets team if you're if you're forecasting, you know, a, a offensive line guru and Bill Callahan being able to get that best out of him, he has the size, height, weight, strength, movement, skills on paper. It's in his body. You just got to get it out of him. Um, that that's the kind of guy that I would I would be 
I, it would it would make the biggest impact for me mentally in terms of comfortability with this team right now. Yeah, I think yeah, mine, I, I would agree. Mine, real quick, uh, I think they, I think in the same kind of sense, I think they do need to sign another cornerback before the draft. Um, whether it becomes in in the next two days, in the next two weeks, I think they need to add maybe one or two because of how barren that room is. Unless you want to go with the statistical. Uh, absolutely chad that is eric error in the statistical category uh i mean you could keep him i guess but other than that you're referring to his yards per catch allowed or whatever that metric was the the one where he is just absolutely dominant in besides that i think can't argue with the numbers man they they have they have to go get at least two i think yeah it's interesting because i think that I think that's all defense, right? I think Mackay Becton, Tyron Smith, they're the only really players. Like if they they spend a little bit of money on Curtis Samuel or a little bit of money on Hollywood Brown, that's all that right. Would, that would, that I mean, you say a little bit. Out. What's what's the number for you, Zach? Where uh, max five Hollywood million Brown. for either of those guys? Okay. Like max where one year, five million dollars. Okay, all right. No, that's no. I mean, anything over, I mean, like, okay, two? maybe 8 million with incentives isn't going to be that bad, but like guaranteed money needs to be 5 million. He hasn't earned, he hasn't done anything to earn higher than that. And you could tell so, by his market that nobody is wants Hollywood Brown because he's been terrible. When right. So targeted. if it pops up on your radar screen, Hollywood Brown, two year, $19.5 million contract, oh, you're furious. It may be worse than, you may see a worse reaction than NWI or Jack Gibbons getting <laughs> $900,000 or nine thousand. <laughs> 900 whatever yeah like that that's ridiculous in in my mind because that that is i mean i get it oh he could just be a wide receiver three problem is he just can't catch it doesn't matter if he's a wide receiver two a wide receiver one that's important just doesn't catch (laughs) um Uh, but anything else like but i do think that if the question i have for you guys before we go makai beckton or tyron smith is signed and let's say that they've been told that they are going to play left tackle. Oh. Trade back Brock Bowers or do you? Hang on, okay. So do you, do you foresee that being a thing where they show their hand in that way? I, I would be floored if they went and got an offensive lineman and a tackle in free agency and said, yep. And guess what? He's playing on this side of the ball for sure. I don't think they show their hand like that. But if they did, yeah, I don't think they do I, I guess either. Too. But so I mean, if they did hypothetically, the, yeah. But if they did hypothetically, that really screams trade back and get picks and take JC Latham, right? It I mean, certainly screams you have. take. Yeah, it, it screams trade back. But I, I'll just go back to what I said earlier when we were talking about tackles. I I don't yeah. really care because they need one of both. So it just it gives me a better idea of who they're going to take. But it doesn't change at all my opinion that they need to take a tackle in the first round. Yeah, it just it would be interesting. Like I, I think that it would be very interesting to see that move made on top of the Calvin Ridley move because I feel like that really hides. That does a really good job of hiding your intentions. Whatever your intentions may be, it does a really good job. And I agree. I forgot the Cameron Curl. Cameron Curl would be up near the top of my list of players that I would want. He could be your safety across from sure. Monty Hooker. So I'd prefer him. I'd go Justin Simmons, Cameron Curl, then Marcus May way down. I'm not a big Marcus May believer, but, you know, it is what it is. It's safety. It doesn't really matter. Uh, I think that'll do it for us. I think we I covered have, everything we wanted to cover on the list. I have one last thing. thing? I'll, yeah, one more thing. Just a random note for folks. Um, along the lines of things that I think, I think that you should look tomorrow morning, sometime before 1130 a.m. Central Standard Time, for the Titans to have another media availability with a certain free agent whose name you may or may not be able to surmise on your own. There you go. All right. I would assume that is a guy by the name of uh, Sadiq Charles. Is who right. It'll be the Sadiq. Right. He'll do 45 minutes on Sadiq Charles tomorrow morning, 10 30 AM. Can't yep. wait. Can't wait. Sadiq Charles, 10 30 AM tomorrow. Um, all right. That'll do it for us. Uh, football show, hot read podcast. Uh, when's your all's next show? Cause this is kind of our, both of our shows. So when's the, yeah, next we show should tell people that just in case you didn't realize it, like we're definitely not doing a show today. The part of the reason, j- just real quick, part of the reason we did this in the first place today was that I almost accidentally did a show, um, with half of my mouth numb. I have a dentist appointment in like an hour. And in my head, I was like, we'll just do the show after that. And then I forgot, like I'm getting a filling. And so that, would have been really entertaining content to see me slobber my way through a show probably. 
but really not uh, high quality. So we're not going to be doing that. This is today's show for the Hot Read Podcast and for a football show. So the next football show will be, I think, Braden's back on Monday, right? Yes. Braden back on Monday. Barring Braden's wherever at... he's at, like I, I, if he's out okay. in the wilderness, barring like getting attacked by a moose or something. I don't know. Where True. He's at. We don't know whether or not he's alive, but assuming that he is, he'll be back with Zach on Monday on a football show at one central. And then we will be back on a hot read pod at four or four 30 PM on Tuesday next week. And those will be when we are next on this feed. Stack in the inbox.com. Go subscribe uh, today. I also have an article out at Pokarski.com. Uh, so go subscribe over there to get that. How many but, times did you uh, mention the sun inbox. exploding? How many times did you get to say it? Uh, four or five, I think. I, there's Impressive. someone that replied like, who's your source that the sun is running out? Is this true about the sun? Who's source? your source? Did you talk to Neil deGrasse Tyson? What's up? So listen, in five billion years old, the sun will have run out of hydrogen. That's all you need to know in five billion years. So you say that out yourself? Did you do the math? Yeah. Okay, I'll set my thought. Yeah, you couldn't, you couldn't Google the sun's running out of hydrogen uh, when, it, right. when it's going to happen. But uh, talked about that there. Uh, got a lot going on at stackinginbox.com, of course, as well. Uh, I don't even know what I'm putting up tomorrow from Stoney at this point because he's got like a bunch of articles banked that I really got to start putting out because it's draft season and all of this stuff is going to have to come out at some point. So, yes, um, contracts are official for most of them. The numbers aren't out on everybody. Chidobe Awuzie, Chidobe Awuzie, I think I got. There you go. That is out. Uh, the, so that's six point nine million dollar cap hit. We of course know Tony Pollard and it was a four million dollar cap hit. Jack Gibbons tender cost nine hundred ninety nine thousand dollars against the cap. So we don't have Lloyd Cushenberry, Calvin Ridley, at least as I refreshed during the show, or Kenneth Murray yet. So I had a couple doing, people ask you this: Do you have a do you have a guesstimate as of now at two twenty eight p.m. on a Thursday? what the Titans existing cap space is. Is it in the like 45 ish million dollar range? It should be probably in the sixties. Oh, right now. And then once you take Lloyd Cushenberry, Kenneth Murray and, um, Ridley. Nick Whisper, Kine, Nick Folk and Calvin Ridley, probably in the fifties. I know. I okay. now listen, this is fifties without, cause you got to remember Spo track does not include, your uh, uh, salary cap hits for draft picks. They also don't include some crazy workout bonus that apparently teams mm -hmm. have to hold or something. And like over the cap, over the cap includes both those things. So over the cap is traditionally always less than Spo track until a certain point in the season where they kind of get close to each other. Gotcha. So on over the cap, it may be in the in maybe under fifty, but Spo track probably in the high fifties. I would assume. Okay, but sure. I mean, again, I haven't haven't gone through and and I'm once we get off of here, I'm going to let the dogs out and then I'm going to update all that stuff. So to there the question go. who let the dogs out, it was me. I let the dogs out. Um, but okay. Seekers Beverages, Kingston Group can't leave them out of the show. Got to make sure that they stay in the show. Kingston Group, buildkg.com for your home remodeling needs. Locally owned, locally owned, locally operated. Mm. Buildkg.com and Seekers Beverages. Uber Eats, they'll drive so you can drink, get whatever you want, beer, liquor, wine, non-alcoholic stuff, THC drinks, it doesn't matter. They have it all at Sinkers Beverages, East Nashville, award-winning Sinkers Beverages. Join the in crowd to make sure that you know, because I forgot to say this at the beginning. Join the in crowd, and JT, you'll have to do our outro because my mouse just died on me. Um, so, <laughs> uh, I'm all, blind all out here. Died on me. Uh, but either way, I think it was the Bluetooth. The Bluetooth died on me. Mm, that, um, so thanks. either way, Sinkers Beverages, Kingston Group, BuildKG.com, and this has been a football show.